We would like to thank everyone for attending today. My name is Sharice Muse and I'm a student advancement specialist at the Mandel School. We'll take a quick minute to introduce our student services team. And at this time, I'll turn it over to Kelly Smith to do her intro. Thanks, Sharice. Yeah, hi, everyone. Thanks so much for attending. We're really excited for the session to kick or continue on sort of our career planning workshops this semester. So yes, my name is Kelly Schmidt, she, hers pronouns. I'm the other student advancement specialist. Um, so excited to get started and I'll pass it over to Kim D. McFarland. <clears throat> Thanks, Kelly. Hi, everyone. It's great to see so many folks joining us tonight and investing in your professional development. My name is Kim McFarlane, and I have the honor of serving as Assistant Dean of Student Services and Career Planning at the Mandel School and work alongside Kelly and Sharice. So thanks again for coming, and we hope everyone has a wonderful time here tonight. I'll turn it back over to Sharice. Thanks, Dean McFarlane. So we'll get started with a quick overview of tonight's session. We'll start with the icebreaker shortly, which is on the next slide, and then we'll go into the Career Pre um, Center presentation. Um, we'll have the speakers from the Career Center um, do a quick introduction, and then we'll go into the presentation for today. Um, and then after that, we'll open it up for questions um, at that time. So at that time, feel free to come off the mute and ask any questions you may have. For those who are um, registered and submitted questions ahead of time, please know that we'll address those throughout the, um, uh, the session tonight. Also, our team have the chat, um, so we will be monitoring that. So feel free to drop any questions you have in the chat. Um, if for some reason your questions are not answered tonight, please feel free to reach out to our team and we'll be sure to address those. Um, so later in the session, at the end, we'll make sure we'll drop our alias email um, in the chat. Um, please know that the session today is recorded. So then we'll go ahead and get started with a check-in, meme check-in, just to see how everyone is feeling today. Um, if you could just kind of drop how you're feeling in the chat. Um, for me today, I think I, it's a number seven, um, just because I was able to get out a little bit before um, the workshop to kind of enjoy some of the nice weather and just kind of looking forward to the nice day tomorrow in February um, that we're having such nice weather. So if you don't mind just kind of dropping how you're feeling today um, in the chat. <clears throat> we'll give you a couple, a little minute for that. <clears throat> and I'm not sure that I can, I'm trying to see the chat. Okay, we have some nines, threes. All righty, and six. <clears throat> One, happy to be here. Great to hear that. <laughs> um, and then um, thanks everyone for, for participating. Um, at this time, I'll turn it over to our um, speakers from the Career Center to do a quick introduction and then go into the presentation. Again, we'll open it up after the presentation um, for questions. But again, feel free to drop any questions you have in the chat and we'll try to make sure we address the ones that were sent earlier um, when you registered, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you so much. I appreciate uh, the introduction, Charisse. Um, So my name is Aisha Zarin and I'm the Assistant Director for Student Experience at the Career Center. Um, it's, it's an interesting title. Um, I'm gonna quickly explain what that really means uh, when I start my presentation. But in our office, we work based on career interest areas. So I think that's the most important part of my job is to co-lead public service career interest area with my colleague here, um, Colin Fish. And I also co-lead um, career interest area that we call exploratory, which is usually for students who are not sure which industry to get themselves into. And also I support our healthcare team um, because we're a big pre-med <laughs> school. So, um, and in addition to my responsibilities at the Career Center, I'm also faculty at the Political Science Department. I teach um, communication skills, conflict resolution, and um, negotiation as well. So um, I look forward to presenting the material um, to you today. And I am um, now um, leaving the floor to my colleague, Colin Fish, to introduce himself. Thank you, thank you. 
Thank you all for, for being here. Uh, my name is Colin Fitch. I'm the Assistant Director for Experiential Learning here at Case Western. And I'm new to Case Western. I've only been here a few weeks, uh, but so excited to be jumping in and co-leading the public service queer interest area. Um, and as part of my role, besides that, I'll be working with students who are interested in business, working with our experiential learning programs, like our practicum program, our Wall Street Trek. Uh, but I'm from Cleveland. I grew, I grew up here. I've been here, raised here. And I'm coming from Cleveland State, working with uh, first generation and low income students. So just happy to be here working with you all tonight and uh, hope to get to know many of you uh, as you embark on your careers here at Case Western. I'll hand it back to my colleague. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> okay, so to um, get us started, I'm just going to ask everyone quickly to scan this QR code if you can um, and register uh, for this event. Um, I know your office is collecting information, who's participating, but also at the Career Center, we're really interested in um, data <laughs> and knowing how many students we reach out to um, um, during an academic year. So if you can quickly um, scan this QR code and register, that would be great. Um, and if you couldn't, that's perfectly fine. Um, if it's not working for you, that's perfectly fine. I'm going to get the participant list at the end. But just you know, to make things a little bit easier, I wanted to put this QR code here. Um, Today, we're gonna to be talking about career preparation and career preparation might mean a lot of things, but we're gonna specifically focus on resume interviewing and also salary negotiations. I just want you to know that, you know, most of those topics would take by itself over an hour long presentation on my end. So when I usually go to various different departments, to give this presentation. My resume presentation takes over an hour. So I just want you to know that this is a very condensed version of my presentation. But as you'll see throughout the presentation that um, we're open to meeting with you one-on-one. -on -one. And I've met some of you already. So um, you know where we exist. And most of our appointments are via um, Zoom. So wherever you are, we're here for you. So um, as I mentioned, I'm going to go through a couple of um, information regarding our office and the programming that we offer to you, and then focused on resume advice, some interviewing tips, salary negotiation considerations. And um, I also would like to share some information about the resources that we have in our office so that um, you know, if you do not have time to time to meet with us one on one, at least you know where our resources exist. And I'd be happy to share this presentation um, with the student advancement team so you can get an access to it as well. So first things first, um, as I mentioned, our office works based on career interest areas. Um, and we have seven career interest areas. Entre entrepreneurship is not represented by one particular career consultant, but the rest of the career interest areas are. So in each career interest area, we have at least two um, uh, career consultants. So we have arts and culture, business, engineering, technology, science, exploratory, healthcare, and public service. So today, Colin and I were representing public service particularly but that doesn't mean that you need to get yourselves into public service if you're maybe interested in a career in healthcare, or maybe you're still exploring, you don't know what to do with your degree. Um, we have career consultants for each career interest area. I always recommend everyone to really follow these steps, and you will be able to see these steps when I share these slides with you. Um, I ask everyone to sign up on Handshake whichever career interest area that they're interested in. Um, you can sign as many career interest areas as you want on Handshake. And the perk of signing um, up for a career interest area is that you receive a biweekly newsletter that is full of career advice and full of uh, job opportunities. I think, uh, Colin, correct me if I'm wrong, but the last um, newsletter we sent out had very good um, job posts for particularly uh, master of uh, Social Work and Nonprofit Organization students. So you can get an access to those uh, by signing up um, your career for a career interest area on Handshake. 
Um, also, we have websites um, for each career interest area. So when you go to our website, case.edu slash student life slash career center slash, you will see on the right hand side under explore your interest uh, interests, we have um, career interest area um, career interest area websites. And on these websites, you can see especially under exploration and decision making and experiential education and jobs there are some you know specialty job boards for those who are interested in getting themselves in nonprofit or education government and law particularly in public service another service we have is one on one career advising so um we provide the service for both our students and our alumni so you can always um, turn to our office by scheduling appointments. Again, you need to go to our website and under uh, career development, you can click on appointments and you can learn how to step-by-step um, -step schedule an appointment with us. We can provide you assistance with job search, internship search, uh, personal statement of, or cover letter review, uh, we can do mock interviews with you if you already have a job uh, interview lined up. We can give you networking and LinkedIn tips. We can review your LinkedIn and help you improve your LinkedIn pages and um, many more career um, advising. If you're lost and if you don't know where to look for, you can always schedule an appointment with us. And when you pick public service, um, you're either going to be scheduled with me or with Colin. Okay, the other service we have is Career Labs. And um, Career Labs are one on one peer advising sessions for both undergraduate and graduate students. So, um, one of the things that we don't um, do during our one on one appointments with you, unless it is during the summertime um, or during the winter break time, uh, we do not dedicate a 30 minute career consultant appointment. Uh, just for resume review, because we have career labs for that. So if you if you want your resume and CV reviewed and also maybe a cover letter that you're putting together for a job uh, application, we have um, our interns in our office that I train um, and they are all around the campus. Um, most of the career labs begin around 11 a.m. and they go all the way and um around 6 p.m., 6.30 p.m., and they're available every day. And you don't need to be in town, even though they are physically located various parts of the campus. Most of these appointments, as you can see in this page, um, are also virtual. So you can um, join one of those career labs and get your um, resume reviewed. You don't need to register, but sometimes, especially this week, it's just before the career fair, I bet most of those career labs are full. But after the career fair, beginning next week, they're going to be um, very open schedules for each career lab. So you can always drop in and get your resume or CV or your cover letter reviewed by our interns. Um, the other uh, particular resource that I want to bring your attention to is, uh, again, when you're on our website, My Career resources. So these are the paid resources. So we pay so that our students and alumni can benefit from those. As you would see, when you click on my career, you're going to get into a page that look like this. And it's going to ask you to log in using your Case Western Reserve University credentials. And you will get an access to uh, platforms like Handshake, my personal favorite career shift, Going Global, Big Interview is a wonderful tool um, that has AI system in it where you can do mock interviews with an AI platform. Um, there is What Can I Do With This Major that you can maybe learn about. What would you do with a Master of Social Work or Master of Nonprofit Organization degree and maybe you know specialty job boards and some links to ONET, which is a government website that gives you information about various different occupations. There is LinkedIn here, Liquid Compass is particularly for healthcare jobs. And of course, there's a quick link to Glassdoor as well. Um, so I want to start uh, with a quick resume review to our resume conversation. And like Sharice mentioned, please um, 
type everything in the chat, but I would welcome if you unmute yourself and tell me how long you think a recruiter would typically look at your resume for the first time. So please go ahead and unmute yourself and tell me which option you would pick. Or if you feel like writing in the chat, please go ahead and write in the chat. One minute, 30 seconds, one minute. <laughs> Okay, I'm I'm seeing a lot of one minute. So um, you're very close. Thank you for sharing. Um, it is around six to 30 seconds. That's how long, if you're lucky, a set of eyes, human eyes are looking at your resume. That's how long they're going to spend unless you get their attention. So if you can get their attention that um, you might get lucky that you can have more than 30 seconds over a minute, ideally. Um, when I say, if you're lucky, a set of eyes will look at your resume, because nowadays, um, a lot of um, companies, especially big companies, use ATS, and that's an AI technology for tracking applicants. So it is even more important nowadays to have your resume um, catered particularly to the position that you're applying to. Um I am not sure if you have ever put together a CV because I think your programs here at Case Western Reserve University required you to write a resume. Am I correct on that one? Um, when you applied for a Master of Social Work, Master of Nonprofit Organizations, I think you're asked to submit a resume. So you already know the difference between resume and CV, I'm guessing. But I just wanted to highlight it to, you know, tell you a little bit more about what goes into resume and what doesn't go into resume. So resume is a one to two page summary. Two page, I am, you know, um, um, very, um, I'm trying, I need to be very careful with two page because, you know, how I like to see resumes, if, if a resume is two page, I would guess that you're at least in the industry for a decade. So I would add uh, one more page uh, per decade that I'm in the industry. So for someone who is right after undergraduate and right after graduate degree, I would expect you have, you know, one page um, resume. And that's a summary of your skills, experience, and education. Those are the most important things that you need to highlight in your resume. Whereas CV is a little bit longer, right? It's more detailed, and usually it includes um, educational academic background. If you have any teaching or research experience, any publications and even presentations can go to CV. And usually graduate schools um, um, expect you to submit a CV. Uh, but if you are an international student, CV is a very typical thing. Uh, we only use resumes in the United States and we really want that executive summary of everything that fit in one page. And the goal of resume is to really brief, concise explanation of why you're applying to this job and what kind of, again, skills, experience, and education you're bringing to table. Um, since we all know now that um, employer is gonna spend, you know, uh, less than a minute, so you have to be very strategic what you're gonna put in your resume. Um, again, you can chat or you can unmute yourselves and answer my question, why do you think resumes matter? Why, why are they important when you're applying to jobs? It gives uh, an overview about yourself to the institution that you apply to and give, you, give them like first uh, look of you. Exactly. First look, first impressions matter. And that's why it's important. Exactly. First impression. Everybody is writing first impression. Yes, that's correct. Um, as you can see, that's my first thing in my presentation. It provides employers a first impression of your professional experiences, skills, and qualifications. Anything else? I know it's 622 here. It's so hard to <laughs> be interactive, <laughs> but I just don't want to be the one who's talking only. Uh, anything else that come to your mind? 
Okay, I'm not gonna push you. <laughs> Go ahead. Sorry, somebody was. Let's say um, you know, resumes matter because it, it tells your story without maybe knowing anyone at the organization, right? So like, if this exactly. may be the only thing that an organization or employer knows about you, right? Um, now, ideally, you might have a network of people you can reach out to at an organization when you're looking at an opportunity, but. Resumes matter because this might be the only physical piece of paper about you when they're considering you for an opportunity, which is why they're so critical, candidly. But anyway, back to my Exactly. Knowledge. No, thank you so much uh, for saying that, um, um, Colin. I really appreciate it. It is a marketing tool, right? You need to advocate yourself in that one-page resume that someone will spend six to 30 seconds on so that you sell yourself. And, you know, who are you most critical of? I personally am most critical of myself. So um, writing your resume, therefore, can be a very stressful process if you don't know what goes into it, right? Because you need to advertise yourself in one page and boom, um, you're expecting to get the job. Um, the other thing that's important to keep in mind is that it is a living document that is in progress, right? So um, I always recommend my students who come to me for resume advice just open a Word document, dump everything in and have a home-based resume. Um, and then you pull things that are relevant for the position that you're applying to and make it a one-page final resume. So your home-based resume doesn't need to be tidy. Just dump everything in there so you don't forget what you're doing. It is a living document because of that. Um, it tells your professional story who you are and it needs to focus on your strengths and also you know, you cannot create a resume and have it and submit it to every single job that you're applying to because you need to show how you're going to add value to that particular job. So you need to really um, change your resume, adapt your resume according to the jobs that you're applying to, according to the new job description that comes in front of you. Um, so it needs to be very much targeted. Um, here are some um, you know, basic resume formatting guidelines. Um, and like some of these things are, um, you know, very specific. Um, but sometimes, you know, if you don't know where to start from, it's good to have some specifics, I thought. So, you know, thinking about your margins, 0.7 to 1 on all sides, maybe avoid putting headers and footers. Any guesses why we don't want you to have any headers or footers? Any guesses? I need to check the chat. I'm asking a question. Thank you so much for these wonderful, you know, additions. I love these sales pitch of yourself. Um, helps the employer to determine if you will be hired or not. Exactly. Any guesses why we don't have Heathers or Footers? There's some new guidelines in resumes and the header and footer cannot be recognized by that darn ATS, okay? Uh, applicant tracking system. So it's the, you know, it's the AI world. So you don't want to risk being vetted in the first initial vetting process. And when there's no human being looking at your resume. Um, the other things that are important to keep in mind, having one uh, font that is, you know, like well accepted, maybe Times New Roman, Arial, Calibri, Garamond, um, avoid using colors, graphics, graphical en enhancement. Again, ATS systems might not recognize those. And just so you know, I'm getting this question a lot nowadays if uh, I can use resume templates. Again, some templates can be your big enemy. You can definitely use templates to get an idea what goes into resume, but some templates are really stuck, bounce from the ATS systems, just so you know. Same thing as uh, spelling and grammatical errors. It's so funny. I have to, have to give this example. I have a very successful student who has long years in customer service. And the job that she was applying to use the concept client services instead of customer services. And that's one of the reasons why she never even got a call from the places that she applied to because the language was not matched and they were using an ATS system in order to review resumes. So you have to be very careful that you match the language uh, with the job description. Again, it's a good thing, but also it's, you know, you have to be careful with, you know, AI systems that the companies are using. 
um, you might want to start all your bullet points with a strong collegiate level action verbs to highlight your accomplishments. We don't use any personal pronouns and resumes. Um, it's very important to use consistent and appropriate verb tense because, you know, the people that are going to look, the recruiters that are going to look at your resume, they're not going to spend a lot of time on your resume. You really want everything to be consistent. If you are a very sensing person like I am, you're probably going to catch those, you know, tiny little details and you can get irritated. You know, recruiters can get irritated by the lack of consistency, especially in tense. Uh, we tend to use present and past simple tense, no continuous tense. And I always give this recommendation, please use a Word document because even though Google Doc is very handy, um, you know, moving everything from Google Doc to PDF because that's the best format to attach your resume on a job application, which is PDF. Things it might look fa uh, funky. You know, when I try to transfer Google Doc documents into PDF documents, they might not look uh, how I put them together in a Google Doc. So you have to be careful with that. Um, and the last rule is honesty is the key. Do not lie, but do not under undersell either. Um, I can't really tell who's lying when I'm reviewing resumes, but I can tell who is underselling themselves. So I'm going to show you some examples and how to really sell yourselves. Um, I am, I, I, there are some really nice questions coming up. I'm hopefully I will answer them um, at the end. Okay. Um, here are some common elements of resume. Um, again, like I said, it's, it might take me a lot of time to go through each element one by one, but I particularly want to highlight heading objective summary and experiences and how to put them in your resume. But of course, you might want to include education, if you have leadership, extracurricular activities, any professional skills. And I want to, you know, make a quick note in professional skills. I see a lot of resumes that has a skills section that lists soft skills. You don't want to list your soft skills under your skills section in your resume. Soft skills can be incorporated within you know, your bullet points under your experiences, skill sections in your resume are usually for language skills or heart skills you might have. Um, certificates and licenses are very important for you. Um, you can, of course, put those right next to your names, right? Um, like how I would put my PhD right next to my name in the heading section. You can definitely do that. Um, professional associations and memberships, please keep in mind, we don't put our references um, in uh, our resume. So quickly, um, heading examples. Um, here are some examples on the side. Um, it's very important, your name should be big and bold and large font. You might wanna have good phone number with appropriate voicemail, please, Avoid using parentheses and separators. Separators and parentheses can again be, um, you know, your worst enemy if the company is using an ATS system. Uh, please put an email address, an email address, and a phone number that you regularly check. Okay, um, so it's very important to, you know, uh, put the most up to date email address and phone number there. We don't put street address anymore in resumes. It's mostly for security reasons. And I always recommend my students to use city and state wisely and strategically. So if you're living in Cleveland, Ohio, but you're not from here, let's say you are from South Bend, Indiana, and you're looking for jobs in South Bend, Indiana, please put South Bend, Indiana, even though currently you are in Cleveland, Ohio, or vice versa. So use city and state strategically. Um, we are using a lot of LinkedIn profiles on our resumes. So again, if you do not have a complete LinkedIn profile, I'd be happy to look at your LinkedIn profile and make it complete. Um, here is a little you know, information according to Resume Go. Job seekers with a comprehensive LinkedIn profile have 71% higher chance of getting a job interview. So it's really important because you know we don't put our pictures. We don't put a lot of information about us, who we are as as a holistic individual in our resume. So most likely if you can get the attention of recruiters, they're gonna look at your LinkedIn profile. So it's very important to keep your LinkedIn profile up to date. One of the things that is very important to keep in mind, 
when you go and cut paste, copy paste your LinkedIn um, into your resume, you'll see that it's going to look like this www.linkedin slash, you know, you know, I should use there and X, Y, Z percentage, like it's going to look very interesting. So you can definitely personalize your LinkedIn um, profile address. It's pretty simple steps. So you can just quickly Google how to personalize my LinkedIn. Um, you might want to have like something like this, maybe your full name dot com. Um, and again, like I mentioned, no photos. Um, nobody needs to know your gender, race, age, citizenship, or other personal sensitive information. Sometimes my students ask, you know, I really want to put my pronouns right next to my name. If you're applying for positions that are, you know, your, um, um, you know, pronouns are important. I recently supported a student who are who was interested in uh, DEI positions, and I thought it was appropriate for um, them to put their they and them pronouns right next to their name. So that's okay, but it's not very typical. So you don't want to disclose any personal information in your in resumes. The other aspect of resumes that I want to mention is objective statement. Um, and I'm just going to turn to my colleague, Colin. I don't know if you have any opinions about objective statements. It's a very subjective part of your resume. It comes, example, right up after your, you know, heading, your information, your name, your LinkedIn, your phone number. Um, and it usually is a one sentence explanation of why you are submitting this resume, what you're looking for, what are your career goals by applying to this position. Um, I know there's a differences of, of opinion on this one. And a lot of people say, you really don't need this. It's like, that's the prime real estate because in English language, we read from left to right and top to bottom. And where objective statements stands is a very prime real estate in your resume. So do you really want to fill it with, you know, a sentence like this, or you really want to put Mundell School, which is, you know, one of the best schools, best programs in town, and which one you want to put in that prime real estate. So there are differences of opinions about that. If you end up using an objective statement, which I am a very objective statement person, so that's why I wanted to turn to Colin. I don't know what you think about it. At least, you know, write something that explains who you are, maybe shine your soft skills and what you're looking for, particularly, and how that job that you're applying to is a good fit for you. Um, so I put like an example for you, you know, seeking a job in social work to gain experience and help people in need is a very broad objective. But another one, you know, passionate master of social work student with focus on mental health, trauma-informed care, seeking to leverage academic training, prior experiences to provide compassionate, effective social services, da 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 da, -da. it goes on and on. But at least it's still a one sentence, but it's a little bit more personalized. So I would prefer the second one over first one. Colin, go ahead. <laughs> No, I, I, I appreciate you asking, my team. I kind of sit in the middle of the table on this. I think it really depends. Um, one, I would agree with you. I think if, if, if I were to say, if you were to put the first, the okay-ish example, I would say it's probably best to just leave it out because you're not saying too, too much, right? That being said, if you feel like you can add what would be an example of the better option here, I think it, it definitely has a place. And it's probably the only opportunity where you have on your resume to really tell a deeper story that's not just your experiences, right? That being said, back to your initial point about length, a one-page resume oftentimes is looked at in a more fond way. So if you're in between listing a critical experience or background that you have you know, professionally versus an objective, I would probably lean more towards listing the experience. But especially for people earlier in their careers who may only have so many opportunities, an objective can be really, really helpful because one, it can help fill the space of your resume, which just is an aesthetics formatting thing, but also can kind of give more credit, you know, more credibility to you as a candidate because you may have less experience, which showcases this person's background. But if you provide a clear and concise objective that tells a story, that might give those recruiters more of an idea of who you are. So you know, that, that's the hard part about resumes. It really kind of depends on your situation, but I think it can be okay. I don't think it's a bad thing. I think it really just depends on what else is on the resume, which is why it's it's great to come to the career labs or come talk to us. Exactly. 
Thank you so much. And, you know, like one of the things that I also want to add about objective statement is that, like Colin mentioned, if you do not have very relevant experience to the job that you're applying to, I think objective might work even for a, you know, strategically ATS perspective, because, you know, maybe you can use some of the job description words that even though you don't have direct experience on in your objective statement saying that, I look forward to working in this industry. I look for, forward to working in counseling or community outreach or whatever that you don't have prior experience, but the job, re, you know, expects you to engage in those um, activities. So, um, you know, again, use it strategically if you want to use it. And the other um, point that I think, you know, the biggest part of your resume is to talk about experiences, right? Um one of the things that I see in resumes is that it doesn't tell me where the experience was at, right? If it's an online experience, write online. But if it's not, please write city and state. Um, use bullet points. Again, starting with strong action verbs. Um, you can be descriptive, accurate, and use professional language. But I really love this Google formula because your bullet points is not just about your job descriptions, but it's also about your accomplishments. And, you know, thinking about each experience that you have that you want to list in your resume with this formula, you don't need to write it as is, right? Accomplished X by doing Y as measured by Z, but it's for, for you to think about um, what did I accomplish in this position? You know, if we were doing the same job together with Colin, which we are doing, right, leading public service, but Colin might have different accomplishments than I do. So what, like, even though we have the same job description, what does Colin do different than me? What did he accomplish, right? It's very important to use your resume bullet points for that. Um, impact is very important. And uh, one of the ways that you can deliver impact is to think about, you know, maybe numbers, right? Um, can you quantify as well as much as you qualify your achievements? Any particular skills you utilize while doing that job? Any skills you learn while doing that job? Um, order matters. So we um, usually follow this uh, rule, reverse chronological order. So your, your most recent experience goes um, to the top uh, right after your experiences and you go all the way back. Um, and sometimes this is another question that I get. What if I worked at Dunkin' Donuts and also at Starbucks? And I also work at as a social worker here in this community organization. So when I list everything, my Dunkin' Donuts is all the way in the top, and then my social work experience comes afterwards. It's perfectly fine to have two separate sections, relevant work experience and other work experience, because, you know, selling coffee at Dunkin' Donuts is a skill, right? It's, it's communication skill. You, you work with people, right? So being in the restaurant industry, that's, again, like a wonderful skill that you can add, okay? Um, so again, like this is the question that I want you to leave with. When you when someone reads your experiences section, does it describe the job or you? And the answer should be you. It needs to be about you, not about the job that you're applying to. So here are like some examples um, that I like, um, borrowed from some of my students' resumes. And um, like the first one is a lab assistant. I really like this format. Of course, doesn't mean you should use that, but it lists the name of the company, which is Case Western Reserve University, the department, city and state, the role of the person, and the time period that they were at in that role. And here it is, like supervised labs of uh, approximately 50 computers and answer student questions on software is a really nice bullet point because this person was just sitting at that lab and waiting someone asking for their help, right? But they're not just, you know, explaining is that I sat at that lab and waited for, you know, troubleshooting, right? That could be a bullet point, which is your job description, but this person, you know, definitely selling the experience to me. Provide troubleshooting assistance and develop a new program for new hire training. Balance full-time course schedule while working 15 hours per week. 
So based on the eye tracking study that has been done, it's very important because recruiters are looking for numbers. We immediately, our eyes go to numbers uh, faster than the um, written content. So it's really important to think about numbers. Can you think of any numbers? And it's, you know, one of the things that I always deal with when I'm supporting master of social work, master of nonprofit organization students, like we don't work with numbers. So why, why are they important? But there are so many numbers involved in your work. How many, you know, families you supported, right? And it's too much. Just, you know, try to condense it, say, I don't know, five case loads per week, right? You can definitely write it that way or, you know, supported like 500 individuals within two months, right? You're just throwing numbers in there. That's that's pretty easy when you start thinking about in terms of numbers. And I gave some examples here, like develop and implemented a comprehensive volunteer recruitment and retention program, increasing volunteer engagement by 30% and enhancing program impact as measured by volunteer satisfaction surveys and program metrics. So I'm thinking about in terms of percentages here. Um, so please keep keep in mind that it's it needs to be about you. Your bullet points need to be about you. And it's all about your achievements and the impact that you, you might want to deliver to the recruiters, to the employers. Oh, time is running. Okay, interviews. <laughs> Uh, preparation is very important for interviews, okay? So you had a wonderful resume, you get your cover letter checked, you um, um, apply to the job, you secured an interview. Um, I want you to be prepared for interviews as well. And like I mentioned before, we provide mock interview services. And most of the time when I do mock interviews with students, okay, is this a virtual appointment? Make sure you sign in two minutes before everybody, you know, is in there. Like if your interview starts at 10 a.m., you got to be there by, you know, 9.55. Make sure everything is set up. If you are going to an in-person interview, you need to know where you're going to. So you got to arrive 10 minutes early. To this position that I applied to, I arrived 15 minutes early and I spent 10 minutes in a bathroom really practicing my, you know, power poses. And it really helps. It really calms you down. Um, and the other, you know, like, I think I have six um, areas that I always ask my students to be careful with. One is, do you know your, do you know your story? Before your interviews, just sit down and write your story. And that's a very personalized advice because in every time I went to job interviews, I sat down and took a moment to write my own story for myself. And it always helped me because I remember the you know, cognizant choices that I made throughout my career and things that I found myself in without really knowing. So writing these things down and remembering the experiences that I had throughout, the anecdotes that I had throughout has always helped me during my interview. So write down your story, write down the skills, write down, you know, important anecdotes that come to your mind. The other thing is research your potential employer. I have looked through probably two years worth of Instagram account of career services when I applied to this position. I listened, I looked at all the posts that they had in addition to studying the website. I wanted to know, like I have listen the Instagram posts of the people that now I work together with, who's my supervisor right now. So it was really helpful. I got advice from them as I was getting ready. So know your employer, follow them on Instagram. I think they have more stuff on Instagram even um, um, compared to their websites. Be aware of nonverbals. Uh, I'm a big believer of nonverbals. And I think that 50% is even more now, I think um, Dr. Mahrabian um, from, don't quote me on that, University of California, one of those universe, one of those California campuses, he discovered that even more than 70% of what we communicate is through nonverbals. So a smile, firm handshake, good eye contact, you know, sitting straight, having open posture, the energy. Oh my goodness, Colin's energy was what really, you know, um, um, you know, impressed us so much because 
he had all these nonverbals when we were interviewing him for the position. He was amazing. Um, so like I mentioned, power poses are very important. Um, Professor Amy Cuddy from Harvard University has a study on this one. There's a wonderful TED talk on this. Uh, like your Supermans, you know, your Wonder Womans, really getting your body, um, you know, physically before you start your interview could really help you. Um, decrease your stress hormones, especially. It's very important to practice as well. So you got to keep practicing. And like I said, we're here for you to practice. Big interview is a wonderful tool. You can watch videos about how to answer some common questions and also practice with an AI system in it. The other considerations are looked apart. And I know the advice that we have been giving over the years have been changed a lot, but I think these are the ones that still stay the same. Look professional, whatever that means for the industry that you're getting yourself in, right? Having a black suit for a creative position might not be professional. It might look very traditional, right? You don't want that. So you know your industry and look professional within that industry. Bring your extra resumes, your reference list, just in case if they ask. Um, have a good notebook, a pen, something to take notes of, show that you have interest in. Um, you know, avoid wearing perfume or cologne is, you know, just to remind you that do not overpower the room. That's what it is. Of course, you're going to wear your cologne, but make sure that those things are not overpowering. Um Smoking, that's one of my, you know, <laughs> pet peeves that I can smell it and it really, you know, throws me off. So you might want to be careful with that. Chew gum um, or eating it could be, you know, like make sure that if you had just have your lunch or your breakfast, that your face is clean. Um, turn off your cell phone. And if this is a pre-recorded, which is a very common interview type nowadays, so the employers, recruiters send you a link ask you to record yourself answering their interview questions, you know, making sure that you are in a quiet space and your Zoom uh, background is, you know, good to go. Your technology is tested is very important. Um, the other point is have your questions ready. You might want to write at least, you know, four to five questions. You can recycle some of the questions that they ask you as well. That is another tip to keep in mind but have your questions written down and show that you have done your research. I remember when I was interviewed for this position, they were asking me about like some numbers and I said, yeah, I saw in your you know, website, 70% of students answer this you know, like survey that you submit. It's like, it just shows them that I have done research about them. I'm interested in learning more about them. So make sure that you do your research and when you're writing your questions that do not ask basic things. So like how many you know students respond to that survey that you submit each year because it's on the website, right? So you don't wanna um, ask questions that are readily available to, to the public. And the last one, the most important thing, you're gonna be so stressed before interviews, but you need to invest in yourself. Get some sleep, eat well, know where you're going um, and how you're planning to get there. So those are very important things to consider. Um, I am not going to go through a lot of these questions, but these are some of the questions that I have seen. Um, the students that I supported has been having difficulty with. Um, the first one is tell me about yourself. Sorry. Tell me about yourself. Um, the other one is, what is your biggest weakness? And like some genuine questions about who you are and your work style. So tell me about yourself is, a, is the first question, right? And tell me about yourself might mean so many things. Walk me through your resume. Why are you interested in this position? What are you going to bring to the table? What qualifications you have, et cetera, right? So I want you to think about this. Um, as your longest answer to any question that they're going to ask you in the interview, but also like an executive summary of all these questions, answers, right? So um, why are you applying to this position? Walk me through your resume. 
highlight the most important experiences, skills that you have, and maybe, you know, think strategically. If these are going to take more than two minutes, just focus on these. But if you think that these are not going to take more than two minutes, you can definitely bring, you know, I love skiing and swimming. In my free time, I'd like to do, you know, I like to travel, right? That's perfectly fine. It shows that you're a holistic person, but that is not the priority here. The priority is walk me through your resume and tell me why we need to pick you. Why this job? Um, the other question is the biggest weakness. We are, like I said, very harsh on ourselves and your weaknesses are irrelevant, even though the question is asking your biggest weakness. What they're trying to see when they ask you about your weaknesses is that what is one of the things that you are working on, that you're growing in, okay? So don't start telling them that, you know, I have, I have difficulty, you know, working in teams and I also, you know, do not have good communication skills. I'm not sure. I don't think I'm empathic enough. It's like, oh, why am I applying to this position, right? Don't go to that route. Just pick one thing that is not directly relevant to the job and show me how you are working towards, you know, making it your strength, okay? So if the position that you're applying to doesn't require presentation skills, maybe, you know, one presentation per, per year, perfect pick presentation skills. I've always been a very shy person in front of like, I'm, I'm having difficulty, you know, presenting material in big crowds. But for the last, you know, year, being in big classrooms and presenting my research to my colleagues, my peers, really helped me a lot, et cetera. And I am now taking lessons of how to give presentations. So show me that you're growing, okay? Um, and with I, work style, go real ahead. Real quick, Aisha. I know we're getting, this is so great. And I know, like we said, these are like all separate topics that we probably could spend an hour <laughs> doing on. And I know we just have like five minutes left, but if we wanted to, we'll share the presentation yes. if that's okay yes. with you yes. after the Perfect. session. But if we want to touch on salary negotiations sure. as well, sure. if that's, that's possible. Perfectly fine. <laughs> yes, no, that's Thank fine, so Kelly. Much. Sorry. I'm like, I can't, like no, I said, I, even though I tried to cut a lot, I, I want to talk yes. more. So, it's challenging, okay. I'm sure. Yes. No, Thank you so much. <laughs> that's perfectly fine. And all these, like all these informations are on big interview. They're really useful videos. I highly recommend you to watch them. You know, tell me about yourself, how to answer behavioral questions, how to ask good questions, you know, um, and like how to follow up after interviews. So here I have two slides for this and I want I I'm going to be very quick on this one. So these are the seven particular things that I want you to think about when they offered you the job, okay? So before you start negotiating, accepting or rejecting any job offer, I want you to think about the job contact content, and I want to explain what VIPs are. Do this job fit with my values, my interests, my personality, and my skills, okay? Um, Who is my supervisor? Salary benefits. And this is not just, you know, when you think about salary, not just about money, okay? Things, professional development, bonuses, um, additional day offs, right? Um, so think about outside the box. It's not just always about money, right? Um, work culture, typical work week. So work from home, right? That's one of the sellers at Case Western Reserve University. Having two days work work from home is like a perfect thing for someone like me who has a family, who has kids, other responsibilities, right? Having work-life balance. So these are my seven considerations, okay? And my final slide is all about thinking about salary negotiations and having a good list of really writing down what you need to be considering, okay? One of the things, one of the mistakes that you could do is say, oh my goodness, this is a wonderful job. Thank you so much for your offer. I accept it, but, okay, that's the worst but you would ever use in your life because you just said you accepted it. So you cannot negotiate after you accept the offer. So what I want you to know is, first of all, know your goal, reach an agreement with an employer to maximize both parties' needs, okay? 
So you need to defend yourself. You need to assert yourself. So I have the experience. I have the education. I have X, Y, and Z that I'm bringing to the table. So if you give me, you know, 5K additional and two additional, um, um, you know, sick days, whatever, then it, I would get really excited about this position and be ready to start, right? So it's very important to assert yourself and show them that what you're bringing to the table. And in conflict resolution literature, we have this concept called expending the pie. So negotiations is not just about money. There are more. So try to be much more creative than just thinking about in terms of money. Because if they invest in your professional development, that might mean more to you at this time period than just having additional 2K, 5K um, extra money. Um, so always ask questions. What is the base of this you know, salary that they're proposing you? And the other thing is use an objective criteria. That has always worked in any sort of negotiation, not only salary negotiations, but in conflict resolutions too. The market value. Right. What is the market value for this position in this city, in this company? So get gain as much as possible. And to really, this is my last sentence, to get uh, more um, information, because in negotiation, information is your currency. OK, so in order to get this, get more powerful in salary negotiations, please network before you apply for that job or after you apply it for that job so that you know how much that company pays and what are the policies. Can you ask for, you know, additional something, right? Maybe it's, um, you know, some promotion, some, you know, sign-in bonus or et cetera. So networking will help you in your salary negotiations. I'm done. Thank you so much. <laughs> there are oh so many gosh, questions. We've... I know. Uh, yes. I know. Glassdoor has it tons of so information. Much. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> and luckily, this isn't the end all be all of presentation. We love that we have you both as such great resources, um, such great presentation. And so, um, yes, if we want to, I know we didn't get to every question maybe in the chat, but if we want to spend a couple minutes, we're coming up on time. But if anybody would like to, we can answer some of those questions if it's okay with our presenters as well. Um, but also we want to do a quick plug before that, and I'll pass it over to Dee McFarland just to kind of wrap up some things and put some things in the chat so people have it right away before we get to additional Q&A if there is any. So I'll pass it over there quick. <laughs> okay, thanks, Kelly. And we appreciate everybody's participation tonight and engaging with the team from the Case Career Center. I think it only emphasizes what valuable resources are available to everyone and that we have great team members to support you along the way with professional development and pursuing careers. So I'll turn it back over because I know we had quite a few questions and if we can just touch on a few of those. Also keep in mind that our team is always available for one-on-one -on -one connection and conversation about your professional development. And we have a lot of resources available to you. Um, so just take advantage of those as needed moving forward. And I'll turn it back over to the team for some of the answers to questions. Yeah, and a lot of the great things that were talked about today were on um, our website that I just put in the chat. But of course um, we can, give contact information uh, for the Career Center and how to connect with them about the resources as well. So just wanna make sure everyone knows before they leave that they can access these things and we'll send out recording of this session too. So again, not just done, And but we appreciate everyone coming tonight if you don't wanna stay on longer, but if, if our presenters are okay with answering a couple questions, I know it's getting late, great. We really appreciate it. Um, and a lot of the questions that were submitted um were already answered thankfully so that's good there were just a couple i know within the chat i'm going to get to that one first of like the worried that the resume was missed because of ai and how long do you wait to maybe follow up with an organization i think just follow up with an organization after you apply to what's sort of the etiquette around that i've heard that question from students so if anybody would like to touch on that 
I've been I've been trying to you know like respond to everything. I think I responded all of them. So if you oh, apply for well. the, yeah, if, if you applied <laughs> for the job, you know I always have like I would check in in a, in a week. Really, if it doesn't show, like if the deadline of the job is um you know passed, um I applied. Let's say the next day is the deadline of the job passed. I'll give a week and then I'll check in, um or two weeks. Right, that's perfectly fine. Immediately after interview, send an email saying, thank you. I'm very interested in this position. You didn't hear from them in two weeks. It's perfectly fine to reach out, right? Um, you know, I'm remain, I'm remaining interested in this position. Uh, what are the next steps, et cetera? You can definitely check in. That's perfectly fine. Give people like a week or two weeks sometimes. Um, because they want to collect everything. They need to find a time in their schedules to meet with everyone. So there's really no shame in checking in. It's just like how you form that email is very important. I'm very interested in this position. I believe I'm going to be a perfect addition to your team, your esteemed team, right? So, uh, um, and always, always um, send an email. Thank you cards. Yes. Thank you cards. Mailing. Thank you cards. That's amazing. Yeah. I uh, love that. And, yeah. And individualized thank yous. Really, that's very important. If you're like three people uh, in your um, interview, sending separate emails to each one of them, highlighting, you know, the question that you asked me made me think about X, Y, and Z. I appreciate, you know, you having the time to sit at my interview Thank you. So like writing those personalized emails are very um, nice as well. That's great. And, and I actually, here over I the got summer. a job from a follow-up actually, because like <laughs> I followed up and they're like, actually, that's why we chose you for the position. So yeah, it definitely makes a difference. And I feel like mailing cards. Yes. <laughs> that might help a lot. That's amazing. Yes. And then um, I think our team can touch on this too, but also wanted to ask you about what are additional networking resources? We do have online students, so they're not necessarily in this area or students are moving to other places after they graduate. So any other resources that Peru has and we can, our team can maybe touch on Mandel School's resources um, with networking as we touched on a little bit earlier too. Um, personally, I like LinkedIn alumni. That's what I always, you know, like find people when I am doing one-on-one -on -one consulting, really having at least one to three three people for them to immediately contact right after our session. Um, and also we have Alumni Career Network. Um, if you want to create a profile there, that would be amazing because what it does is when you create your profile um, as a student and as an alumni, you can just write a note. You're willing to help, let's say, someone moving to your hometown. You're willing to connect and help people, you know, just to, to that, you know, city and state. And also you can put things like, I'm interested in supporting people who are interested in my industry. So Alumni Career Network is like a mini LinkedIn for case people. That's how I like to advertise it. And you can definitely create a profile. And at Career Center, we manage that. So our colleague, Marcos Rivera, will, you know, let you in. So um, not everybody is allowed. So it's like LinkedIn for case people. And I'm going to put the link here so you can create a profile um, as well. Um, it's already in the chat, Aisha. Yeah. Oh, perfect. <laughs> it. oh, yeah, it's like you all doing well. Yeah. Teamwork, teamwork. Yeah. <laughs> And we also have an alumni office at the Mandel School. So if students, you can email Mandel Student Services and we can connect you with them. We do have a mentorship program, which we will be giving out information and promotion for uh, this pretty soon, like in a week or two. So stay tuned for that. Um, and feel free if anyone right now has a question. The only other question we had was about exit interviews, which I think has not been touched on yet. So I thought that was interesting and how to sort of strategize around that or how to leave a job in good standing and the strategies you all can provide. Sure. Oh, you're open. 
Yeah. Go ahead, Colin. Okay, okay good. I thought you were going to hear what um, Yeah, so exit, I mean, obviously, you know, the, the, the commonplace example is you don't want to burn bridges, right? That, that's, that, that's the advice I think all of us have heard. That being said, I think there is some wisdom and benefit to yourself and to the organization to be honest in exit interviews in a tactful way, right? So if you face challenges, whether it was with organizational structure or, you know, dissemination of communication, et cetera, I think it's okay to share those things in a way that's not critical of an individual, right? I think you never want to personally point a finger at an individual person, but I think it's definitely appropriate to talk about challenges an organization may have or challenges that you faced for the benefit of future employees of that organization. And I often I a conversation myself with a prior organization that lended to a new relationship I had with someone there because of the feedback I was able to provide. So you want to kind of tell that line respectfully of not you know, pointing fingers and, and casting blame, but also being honest about your experience. Um, but but I do think you always want to have in the back of your mind, you know, the world of work is small, um, particularly if you're location bound. Um, so you want to make sure you're leaving places in a better place than you found it, um, for lack of a better term. But I definitely think honesty is, is key as always. Yeah, that's really helpful. And I think our, stu our students have field practicum um, in our curriculum for MSW students and some MNO students. So I think that's good advice too, just for as they're approaching graduation or approaching next year's field placement. Um, yeah, some of those insights are really helpful for those situations too. So, yeah. And well, I think those were, oh, go ahead. One, one more quick thing, one of the other questions, and these are all like through my interactions with students on a day-to-day -day basis. When am I going to tell my prior, like current employer that I am leaving? Do not say anything until you get that <laughs> written job offer. Please, that's like, I cannot emphasize this more because, you know, I get these whenever, whoever I support, they get a job interview. I'm so like, I'm, I'm so happy that I got the interview and they just gave me the job offer immediately after. I'm going to tell my, you know, like employers, like, did you get it written? It's like, not yet. They're in the process of putting together my contract. No, just wait until you get that. So it's very important. Things can happen. So unless you don't have a written offer, please do not say bye <laughs> to your current employer. Yeah, that's helpful. Well, great. I think that was really all the questions like, I know it was crunched, uh, like we said, a little bit. We really appreciate any final thoughts anyone had or last questions before we kind of wrap up. I'd like to leave space for that. Great. Anyone from Mandel Student Services want to say anything else? We really appreciate people staying on longer. Um, but again, this is not the end. We can continue to talk either with um, the Mandel Student Services team or connect you with the Career Center, Career Center as well. So feel free. But thank you, everyone. We really appreciate everyone attending. I know it's late. So, yes, thanks, everyone. But this will wrap it up then. Thank you. Thanks, Rudy. <laughs> I really appreciate. Yes, great job. We really appreciate you helping us and great advice. So, yes. Perfect. Have a good night, everyone. Bye.